Shalom, shalom to all my fellow brothers and sisters out there. It's me again, Damian Power from YeshuaSavesAll.com. Peace be to you in the name of our Father, Yahweh, and our Master, the Son of Yahweh, Yeshua HaMashiach. So last week we talked about Yom Teruah, the instructions for Yom Teruah. This week is about Yom Kippur, 2023. So it's the second of the fall Moed or Moedim appointed times of our Father Yahweh. And Yom Kippur is on S-E-P-T-E-M-B-E-R, the 29th. Okay, so we all know his days begin in the evening. So starting with the 28th at sundown through the 29th sundown is Yom Kippur. And it's considered the most set apart, the most Kodesh day of the year. So make sure you do no work on this day, for it is a Shabbat Shabbaton, a day for a complete stopping, complete ceasing from all activity, just as the weekly seventh-day Shabbat is. So both of those days are Shabbat Shabbatons. And if you notice, Yom Kippur follows on F-R-I-D-A-Y, the six days of the week, preparation day. And immediately after that is the weekly seventh-day Shabbat. So two Shabbat Shabbatons back-to-back. So what I always do is I prepare my food um, the day before, on the fifth day of the week, to have everything ready to go, being that we can't cook, work, or do anything on any of the Shabbat Shabbatons. So when you do that on the fifth day of the week, you'll be ready for the weekly seven-day Shabbat. you have all your food prepared. So just a suggestion. Okay, so we will be discussing what Yom Kippur is, how to observe Yom Kippur, what is involved in a fast, and I'll also get asked, do children have to fast? So we're going to cover that. And Yeshua being our Kohen Agadol, our high priest. So let's turn to the book of Yovelin, Jubilees, to see when Yom Kippur was instituted. All right. Jubilees, Yovelin, chapter 34, verse 12 through 18. And the sons of Yaakov, Jacob, slaughtered a kid and dipped the coat of Yosef, Joseph, in blood. And sent it to Jacob the father on the tenth day of the seventh month. That's Yom Kippur. And he mourned all that night, for they had brought it to him in the evening. And he became feverish with mourning for his death. And he said, An evil beast has devoured Joseph. And all the members of his house were grieving and mourning with him all that day. And his sons and his daughter rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted for his son. And on that day, Bilhah heard that Joseph had perished, and she died mourning him, for she was living in Kaphratif. And Dina also, his daughter, died after Joseph had perished. And these three mornings came upon Yisrael, Jacob, in one month. And they buried Bilhah over against the tomb of Rachel, Rachel, and Dina, his daughter. They also buried there. And he mourned for Joseph for one year and did not cease. For he said, Let me go down to the grave mourning for my son. For this reason it is ordained for the children of Israel that they should afflict themselves on the 10th of the seventh month on that day that the news which made him weep for joseph came to jacob his father that they should make atonement for themselves with a young goat on the 10th of the seventh month once a year for their transgressions for they had grieved the affection of their father regarding joseph his son and this day has been ordained that they should grieve for their transgressions and for all their transgressions and for all their errors so that they might cleanse themselves on that day once a year. Okay, so now what I would like to do is look at the audio um, and see what the audio tells us about Yom Kippur. So the etymology for the word atonement is H. 3725, which is Kippur. And this is it's spelled Kof Yod Pe Wa Resh. So we have Kof Yod Pe 
wall resh okay kop yo pay wall resh spell kipol which means atonement so when we look at it kof which is a picture kof is a picture of an op open palm it means bend open allow to cover tame the work of yeshua yo is a picture of an arm and a hand it means work action throw worship deed pay is a picture of a mouth it means speak praise blow scatter edge beginning of wall is a picture of a tent peg it means secure add hook join together and resh is a picture of a man's head it means first top beginning chief leader so when we combine Kof, Yod, Pei, Wa, Resh, the spell Kippur, we get this message. The work of Yeshua on the stake to cover our actions speaks of securing our salvation from the very beginning. Again, the work of Yeshua on the stake to cover our actions speaks of securing our salvation from the very beginning. Okay, we know that the very first word in Genesis, Bereshit 1 1, says exactly that. Says exactly that. Is uh, the son of the Most High El should be destroyed by his own hand on the execution stake. That's what that word means when we look at it in the audio. So from the very beginning, it also is talked about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 through 20. Okay, now. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 23, verse, um, verse 26 through 32. And this is from the Samaritan Torah. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, On exactly the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a set-apart reading for you. So, like, well, like I always say, is it's a set apart reading. We read scriptures that pertain to each appointed time, and we also gather together so that we can read those scriptures that uh, uh, pertain to that appointed time. So it shall be a set apart reading for you, and you shall humble your souls. You shall humble your nefeshot, your souls, and present an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And you shall not do any work on this same day. For it is the day of atonement to make atonement on behalf before Yahweh your Elohim. For any soul who will not humble himself on this same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. For any soul who does any work on this same day, that soul I will destroy from among her peoples. Because it's a Shabbat Shabbaton. And you shall not do any work. It is to be a statue throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It is to be a Shabbat of complete rest to you. I love how the Samaritan translate that because they're capturing Shabbat Shabbaton. Complete stopping, complete ceasing from all activity. And you shall torture your soul. On the ninth of the month at evening, from evening until evening, you shall rest on your Shabbat. Hallelujah. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29 through 31 in the Samaritan Torah. And in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall torture your souls and not do any work, whether a citizen or the proselyte sojourning among you. So the proselyte is the Gentile convert who is now uh, considered as one of the native born. Sojourning among you. For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean for all of your offenses before Yahweh. It is to be a Shabbat, a rest for you that you shall torture your souls. 
It is a permanent statue. Numbers chapter 29, verse 7 through 11 in the Samaritan Torah. And on the tenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a set apart reading. And you shall torture your souls. And every labor you shall not do. And you shall present a burnt offering to Yahweh as a sweet savor. One bull, one ram, seven male sheep, one year old. Having them without defect and their grain offering. Fine flour mixed with oil. Three tenths, three tenths for a bull, two tenths for one ram. And a tenth for each sheep of the seven sheep. And one male goat for, for an offense offering, besides an offense offering of atonement, and the continual burnt offering, and its grain offering, and its drink offering. Okay, so to go along with this, we already know, like I showed from the um, the audio, the work of Yeshua and what he did for atonement. And we see that animal sacrifices were required on the day of atonement. So I have had people ask me before, well, what do we do about that? So I just want to want to touch on this, is we know that Yeshua is the Lamb of Yahweh who takes away the iniquities of the world. Hallelujah. And um, that's written in John, Yochanan 129. And most translations says this is the Lamb of Yahweh who takes away the iniquities of the world. But I love the Ivory, the Hebrew manuscript, which says this is El who takes away the iniquities of the world, okay? So he, he offered up himself with his own blood and not the blood of bulls and goats. So it's important to see what Yeshua did for us, his atoning blood for us on the execution stage. Again, pointing back to the etymology for the word, for the word Kippur. So Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 through 14, I'm going to read it from the Aramaic. And he did not enter with the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the set-apart place and obtained for us everlasting salvation. For if the blood of goats and calves and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were defiled, cleansed them even to the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Mashiach, Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to Elohim, Purify our conscience from dead works, so that we may serve the living Elohim. For this cause, he became the mediator of the new covenant, and by his death, he became salvation for those who transgressed the old covenant. One more time. He became the mediator of the new covenant, and by his death, he became salvation for those who transgressed the old covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. And this matches Titus 2.14 in the complete Jewish scriptures. He, being Yeshua, gave himself up on our behalf in order to free us from all violation of the Torah. What did we see in Hebrews that I just read? He became salvation for those who transgressed the old covenant. I tell you, the scriptures don't contradict themselves. Akeem, my brothers, and Akao, my sisters, and anybody who's watching. Titus 2, 14. Yeshua gave himself up on our behalf in order to free us from all violation of the Torah and purify for himself a people who would be his own, eager to do good, which is also another match in Isaiah um, chapter 53, right? Psalms chapter 130, verse 7 through 8, in the complete Jewish scripture says, Yisrael, put your hope in Yahweh, for mercy is found with Yahweh, and with him is unlimited redemption. He will redeem Yisrael from all the wrongdoing. Well, how did Yahweh redeem Yisrael from all the wrongdoing? By sending his son Yeshua, Ael the son of the Creator dying for His creation and rising on the third day. It matches Titus 2, 14, Isaiah 53, Hebrews 9. And then we also have Daniel 9, 24 in the Aramaic. Seventy times seven weeks are determined upon your people and upon your set-apart city to finish the transgressions 
and to make an end of offenses and for the forgiveness of iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to fulfill the vision of the Nevi'im, the prophets, and to give the most set apart to the Messiah. That's a prophecy of Yeshua. So, Yeshua fulfills the animal offerings for us with his blood, and it's the sweet fragrance that Yahweh mentions in the, um, the animal offerings, sacrifices for Yom Kippur, for the burnt offerings mentioned in Leviticus and Numbers, which matches what Paul says in Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Mashiach, Messiah, also has loved us and gave himself for us as a gift, an offering to Yahweh for a sweet smelling fragrance. Hallelujah. So we see for Yom Kippur that we are not to do any work. We're to have a set apart gathering. We're in a set apart reading as well as is written in the Samaritan Torah. Grieve for our iniquities to completely afflict our souls and deny ourselves or torture our souls, which means at least a 24-hour fast of no food and water. We can deny ourselves through fasting because we need food and water to live, and in doing so, we are denying our being or torturing our souls for the day. Okay, so ana means to bow down or afflict, and nefesh means a uh, soul or yourself. So we look at Psalms to Helene 35 13 says, I humbled my soul with fasting. So we see uh, part of humbling your soul is to fast. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 3 in the Aramaic, why have we fasted and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted ourselves and you took no notice okay so there it is again and then let's look at matthew my teeth yahoo chapter 9 verse 14 through 15 from the hebrew gospels.com then the disciples of john came to yeshua mashiach saying why do your disciples not afflict themselves like us and the pharisees so Yeshua Mashiach said to them, because of the bridegroom, while he is alive, all of them who are with him are not able to be quenched. But when the time comes, that man will hide the bridegroom, then they will fast. So we can see again the connection between afflict themselves and fasting are synonymous. Okay, so... Um, Again, we see that denying ourselves, humbling ourselves, afflicting, torturing our souls means to fast, which is what we are supposed to do on Yom Kippur. So I want to go a step further. And so scriptures that support Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement being a day of fasting. Okay, so let's look at the Damascus document, uh, chapter 6, verse 19. The Damascus document, chapter 6, verse 19. They shall keep the Shabbat day according to its exact interpretation. And the feast and the day of fasting, according to the finding of the members of the new covenant and the land of Damascus. Hallelujah. So we know that the rest of our feast, right, where we actually are eating, and then there's the day of fasting, which is the day of atonement. No eating on that day. No drinking. 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 13 in the Aramaic. Even after a certain rate every day, offering according to the commandment of Moshe, Moses, and on the Shabbats and on the solemn feast, three times a year, and the feast of unleavened bread, and in the feast of fasting, and in the feast of tabernacles. So it's also called the feast of fasting. Let's look at Acts chapter 27, verse 9, and the Aramaic Peshetta, the Lamza. There we remain for a long time, even till the day of the Jewish feast was over. And since it had now become dangerous for anyone to sail, Paul gave them advice. So we see the day of the Jewish fast. I'm sorry, the day of the Jewish fast. All right. Now let's look at it in. Acts chapter 27, verse 29, same chapter, same verse. 
I'm going to read it from the Aramaic English New Testament. It says, and we were there a long time, so after the day, after the day of the Jewish fast. So, there's a footnote marked number 205 in the Aramaic English New Testament. And it says, this is Yom Kippur. So, it's also called the Jewish fast. The Feast of Fasting. Okay, now... Let's look at the, uh, the complete Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is the Prayer for Festivals. Prayer for Festivals 1Q34. This is how it reads. Prayer for the Day of Atonement. Remember, O Yahweh, the Feast of Mercies and the time of return. You have established it for us as a feast of Fasting and an everlasting precept. You know the hidden things and the things revealed. So the context is there. This is a prayer for the festivals and it's called the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Fasting. And it's an everlasting precept just as Yahweh had commanded us in the Torah. Hallelujah. Now, the next thing is, do children have to fast? Now, I want to go to the Samaritan Torah, page 286, and it says, Soul, soul. The Israelite Samaritans understood soul in this regard as the infant that must fast on the day of atonement of the year in which the infant was weaned from the breast. The Jewish halakha understood the soul as being one who has reached 13 years of age. So let's test 13 years of age versus one who is weaned from the breast. Okay. Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 21, verse 8 in the Samaritan, and all the translations read the same. And the child grew, referring to Yitzhak, Isaac. The child grew and he was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac, his son, was weaned. Okay, so weaning is when a child is completely off of the breast milk, which can be anywhere from the ages of 18 months to four years, and some say five years maximum. So we can agree that Isaac was not 13 years old when he was weaned. He was anywhere from, uh, from 18 months to 5 years old max. So it appears that the Samaritans have it correct. That once a child is weaned, then he or she should participate in the fast. Okay. Now, let's look at Judith chapter 4, verse 9 through 15. Then every man of Israel cried to Elohim with great adore. And they humbled their beings with great fervency, both they and their wives and their children and their cattle and every stranger and hired man and their servants brought with money and put sackcloth on their loins. So every man and woman and the little children and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, fell before the temple and threw ashes upon their heads and spread out sackcloth before the face of Yahweh. They also put sackcloth around the altar and cried to the Elohim of Israel, all with one accord earnestly, that he would not give their children as prey and the wives as spoil and the cities of their inheritance to destruction and the set-apart place to defilement and reproach, and for the nations to rejoice at. So Elohim heard their prayers and looked upon their affliction, for the people fasted many days. And in all Judah and Jerusalem before the set-apart place of Yahweh Elohim. So there we see children were involved. Now, let's look at Jonah chapter 3, verse 1 through 7 in the complete Jewish scriptures. The word of Yahweh came to Jonah, Jonah, a second time, set out for the great city of Nineveh and proclaimed to it a message I will give you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh as Yahweh had said. Now Nineveh has such 
was such a large city that it took three days just to cross it. Jonah began his entry into the city and had finished only his first day of proclaiming. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. When the people of Nineveh believed Elohim, they proclaimed a fast and put, sack, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. He then had, he then had this proclamation made throughout all Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, no person or animal, herd or flock, is to put anything in his mouth. They are neither to eat nor drink water. So, um, as always, take it to our Father Yahweh in prayer. But I believe that these are strong scriptures to support it, to go along with what the Samaritans um, have said. Now, what is involved in a fast? We firstly deny ourselves by not eating or drinking any water. We must turn away from our own desires, pleasures, and to completely seek Yahweh's face. And we are not to oppress others. I would like to also like to recommend laying in sackcloth as well, as they did in ancient Yisrael. And if you're able to put dust or ashes on your heads to completely humble yourselves, you can get dirt from outside, which I've done before, or you can get ashes from a grill, okay? And you can put that on your head because we see that all throughout scriptures with what I'm about to read. And what is sackcloth? It's a very coarse, rough fabric woven from flax, hemp, or jute vegetable fibers. And um, the one that I purchased, I think it was two or three years ago, was on Etsy. You can find it on Etsy. You type in sackcloth. Okay, so here are some examples of what is usually done during a fast, which included weeping, mourning, fasting, sackcloth, ashes. Joel, chapter 2, verse 12. Yet even now, declares Yahweh, turn to me with all of your heart and with fasting and with weeping and mourning. Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, chapter 4, verse 8. For these things, gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament and wail, for the anger of Yahweh has not turned away from you. 2 Maccabees chapter 13, verse 10 through 12. When Judah learned of this, he commanded the multitude to call on Yahweh night and day, that he would help them now, if ever at any time, being at the point that their Torah, their country, and the set-apart temple taken from them and that he would not allow the people that had only just now been a little refreshed to be in subjection to the blasphemous nations. So when they had all done this together and pleaded for the kindness of Elohim with weeping and fasting and lying flat upon the ground for three days, Judah, having encouraged them, commanded that they make themselves ready. So as we can see, they lied flat upon the ground, um, which is not a comfortable thing to do, by the way. So this is another, another example of torturing your souls in complete humility because it's not comfortable. Okay, Try lying upon the ground flat like that as long as you can and sackcloth, which is something I've done just as uh, I just read from. It's, it's not a comfortable thing to do. This is why they did this, to be heard by Yahweh, because you're torturing your soul. Okay, now, Job chapter 16, verse 15, complete Jewish scriptures. I sewed sackcloth over my skin and laid my pride in the dust. 1 Maccabees chapter 3, verse 46 through 47. Therefore... The, Israel, the Israelites assembled themselves together and came to Mitzpah, opposite Jerusalem. For in Mitzpah was the place where they previously prayed in Israel. Then they fasted that day and put on sackcloth and threw ashes on their heads and they tore their garments. So we see fasting, sackcloth, ashes. Judas. Chapter 4, verse 9 through 15. 
Then every man of Israel cried to Elohim with great adore, and they humbled their beings with great fervency. This is the one I read earlier. Both they and their wives and their children and their cattle, and every stranger and hired man and their servants brought with money and put sackcloth on the loins. So every man and woman and little child and inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the temple and threw ashes upon their head and spread out sackcloth before the face of Yahweh. They also put sackcloth around the altar and cried to the Elohim of Israel with one accord earnestly that he would not give their children as prey and their wives as spoil and the cities of their inheritance to the destruction and the set apart place to defilement and reproach and for the nations to rejoice at. So Elohim heard their prayers and looked upon their afflictions, for the people fasted many days. And all of Judah and Jerusalem before the set-apart place of Yahweh Elohim. So we see fasting, we see sack, sackcloth, and dust and ashes upon their heads, and Yahweh heard. He heard. Job chapter 42, verse 6. Therefore I recant, I recant, and repent in dust and ashes. Lamentations chapter 2 verse 10. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground are silent. They have thrown dust on their heads and have girded themselves with sackcloth. 1 Kings chapter 21 verse 27. And it came to be when Ahab, Ahab heard these words that he tore his garments and he put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and uh, wept and went softly. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 1. And this is complete Jewish scriptures. On the 24th day of this month, the people of Yisrael wearing sackcloth and dirt on them assembled for a fast. Matthew chapter 11, verse 21. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Because if the miracles which were done in you have been done in Sor or Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And again, Jonah chapter 3, verse 4 through 5. And Jonah began to go into the city. On the first day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the men of Nineveh believed Elohim and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the, from the greatest to the least of them. Hallelujah. Now let's go to Yeshua being our high priest, our Kohen Hagadol. Everything points to Yeshua and His atonement again. Pointing back to the word Kippur, atonement, which I showed from the etymology um, and the odio. Hallelujah. It all points to him from the very beginning. So also surrounding Yom Kippur, Yom HaKippurim, is that everything points to Yeshua just as the entire Tanakh, the Old Testament, does. In ancient times, the high priest would go into the tent of meeting once a year and go behind the veil and to the Kadosh HaKadoshim, which many know as the Holy of Holies, and make atonement for himself, his household, and the assembly of Israel. He will sprinkle blood on the mercy seat that's set above the Ark of the Covenant. Look at Leviticus chapter 16, verse 14 through 17. Then the high priest will confess the iniquities, transgressions, and the wickedness of Israel to the forehead of Azazel, the scapegoat, and a fit man would send him into the wilderness with their iniquities, and that goat himself would bear the wickedness of the people, right? So it's just a constant reminder how, of how everything was a foreshadow of Yeshua being the perfect sacrificial lamb. Just like the blood of the perfect lamb spared the children of Israel in Mitzrayim, Egypt, when Yahweh passed over and protected them. Is the same way the perfect blood of the Lamb of Yeshua saves us from iniquity and death as it passes over us, right? So let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 16 through 19 in the Aramaic. And the effect of the gift of Elohim was greater than the effect of the offense of Adam. 
For while the judgment from one man's offense resulted in the condemnation of many, the gift of Elohim, forgiveness of iniquities, resulted in righteousness to many more. For if by one man's offense death reigned, how much more those who receive abundance of mercy and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Yeshua HaMashiach. And like manner, as by one man's offense, condemnation came upon all men. Even so, by the righteousness of one man will the victory of life be to all men. For as by one man's disobedience many were made transgressors, so by the obedience of one man shall many be made righteous. Hallelujah. That's Isaiah 53.10. Yeshua gave himself up to make many righteous. It's all over scripture. While atonement was being made, the high priest did all the work and the community of Israel did not need to do anything. Just as Yeshua is our high priest and he has already done the atoning work for us on the execution state. Okay. We still must observe this day because it's an everlasting uh, commandment in the Torah. And we already went over how to observe this day. Yeshua is our high priest who intercedes for us at the throne. As we see it written in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 through 2. Now above all we have a high priest, a Kohen Hagadol, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And he has become the minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which Elohim pitched and not man. Yeshua is our high priest and king, Melech, in the order of Melchizedek. He's king, priest, and prophet. Okay? And there was only one other king, priest in scripture, and that was Melchizedek. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out loaves and wine, and he was the priest of El Yom, Elohim. And if we go to Psalms chapter 110, verse 4, Yahweh has sworn, and he will not lie, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So let's go over to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. If therefore perfection had, had been reached by the Levitical priesthood by which the law was enacted for the people, what further need was there that another priest, Kohen, should arise after the order of Melchizedek? Otherwise, the scriptures would have said that he would be after the order of Aaron. And so the scripture doesn't say that Yeshua would be after the order of Aaron's priesthood after Melchizedek. So Melchizedek in the order of Melchizedek, meaning that it predates the Levitical priesthood. It's more superior. That is what Paul was conveying to his brethren, showing that Yeshua is the promised Mashiach, which, which matches with the, um, the Qumran community, the Zadok priests, the Dead Sea Scrolls. They already knew this. They already knew this. So we go to the Dead Sea Scrolls and go to um, 11Q13, the coming Melchizedek. The coming Melchizedek says, and concerning what scripture says, and this year of Jubilee, you shall return, every one of you, to your property, Leviticus 25, 13. And what is also written, and this is the manner of the remission, every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against a neighbor, not exacting it of a neighbor who is a member of the community, because Elohim's remission has been proclaimed, Deuteronomy 15, 2. The interpretation is that it applies to the last days and concerns the captive, the captives, just as Yeshayahu, Isaiah said, to proclaim the jubilee to the captives, Isaiah 61.1. Just as, and then um, that part is missing, from the inheritance of Melchizedek, for Melchizedek, who will return them to what is rightfully theirs? He will proclaim to them the Jubilee, thereby releasing them from the debt of all their iniquities. He shall proclaim this decree in the first week of the Jubilee period that follows the nine Jubilee periods. Then the Day of Atonement 
shall follow after the tenth jubilee period, when he shall atone for all the sons of light. And the people who are predestined to Melchizedek, which is a reference to Yeshua in the order of Melchizedek, upon them, for this is the time decreed for the year of Melchizedek's favor. And by his might, he will judge Elohim's set-apart ones and so establish a righteous kingdom, as it is written about him in the songs of David. An Elohim-like being has taken his place in the council of Elohim in the midst of divine beings. He holds judgment. And even there, the Qumran community understood that Yeshua is El. Hallelujah. Testament of Levi, chapter 8, verse 14. And the third will be called a renewed name because a king, Melech, will arise from Yehuda, Judah, and will establish a new priesthood. See, he's coming from the tribe of Judah and not Levi. Yeshua is king and priest. You see that? After the fashion of the nations to all nations, and his presence is beloved as a prophet of the Most High, which is also a reference to Deuteronomy 18.18 18, of the seed of Abraham. Hallelujah. Now, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13. Even he shall build the temple of Yahweh, and he shall bear the esteem and shall sit and rule upon his throne. He shall be a priest upon his throne. King. And right there in that scripture is saying, and right there in that one verse, priest and king. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Hallelujah. So the work that the human, the work that the human high priest did was a shadow of what is to come. But Yeshua will be the, he, he's the final atonement. He's the final atonement for us because he has already done the work of atonement. We don't have a human high priest sacrificing animals anymore as we are all the temple. And Yeshua is our high priest. And unlike the human high priest, um, Yeshua doesn't have to make a sacrifice for his own iniquities because he was perfect. He was without iniquity. And he also makes continual intercessions for us at the throne. And unlike, human, unlike the human high priest, Yeshua does not die. He lives forever. He's a permanent high priest. Hebrews 4.14 We have, therefore, a great Kohen Haggadol, high priest, who has ascended into heaven, Yeshua HaMashiach, the son of Elohim. Let us remain firm in his faith in Emunah, for we do not have a high priest who cannot share in our infirm infirmities, but we have one who is tempted with everything as we are, and yet without iniquity. Hebrews 7, 26-27 For it was fitting that we should have such a Kohen Haggadol, high priest, kind, innocent, undefiled, have been separated from transgressors and exalted above the heavens, who does not need as those high priests to offer up slaughter offerings day after day, first for his own iniquities and then for those of the people. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. First John, first Jokanon, chapter 2, verse 1. My children, I'm writing you these things so that you won't transgress. But if anyone does transgress, we have Yeshua the Mashiach, the Messiah, the righteous who pleads our cause with the Father. Also, he is the atonement for our offenses, but also for those of the whole world. Hallelujah. Die to self. Yeshua, being Elohim the Son, gave up his authority as king and humbled himself to die for us, which is written in Philippians. Um, if you read Philippians 2, 6-11, and then also it's written in um, 2 Corinthians 8, I think, believe, verse 9. By his poverty we became rich. It's, it's so deep. So he gave up his authority as king and humbled himself to die for us. This is love, and we need to follow that example by giving up ourselves and denying our ex existence and follow our master Yeshua's example. Yom Kippur teaches us to die to self. 
denying ourselves, afflict our souls, weep, mourn, and live for him. As we remember to deny, humble, and afflict our souls during Yom Kippur and Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement, let us use Yeshua, our Messiah's example of how he completely denied his own existence for our sake when he said in Matthew 26, 39 in the Hebrew, and he went a little further and bowed his face and said, My father, if it is possible thing, remove this death from me. However, not according to my will, only to yours. Matthew chapter 16, verse 20, 24 in the Hebrew. And then Yeshua said to his Talmudim, his disciples, Whosoever wants to follow after me is obligated that he should give up hope. For himself and that he take his warp and wolf his execution stake and follow after me Yeshua died so that we may live and freed us from the law of iniquity and death which is written in Romans 8 that's the only law that we're free from is iniquity and death by breaking the chains of Satan so that we don't have to suffer eternal torment Yahweh poured out his wrath upon his only son so that we do not have to face to face what we are so deserving of on Judgment Day. We have been redeemed by His blood. So let us put our lives and fleshly, desire, fleshly desires to the side and do what our Father Yahweh's will is and be obedient and walk with Yeshua. We are to keep the commandments and believe in Yeshua HaMashiach, the written, the living Torah. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 15 in the complete Jewish scriptures. For the Messiah's love has hold of us because we are convinced that one man died on behalf of all mankind, which implies that all mankind was already dead and that he had died on behalf of all in order that those who live should not live any longer for themselves but for the one who died on their behalf and was raised. Which is on the shirt right here. Yeshua died for us so that we should live for him. First John chapter 4, verse 9 through 10. By this, the love of Yahweh was manifested in us, that Yahweh has sent his only brought forth son into the world in order that we might live through him. And this love, not that we love Yahweh, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning offering for our iniquities. Hallelujah. So that right there, those scriptures is a perfect definition of what grace is. Grace is unmerited favor that we did not earn or deserve. It's simply out of, out of the love of Yahweh that he sent his son Yeshua to die for what we deserved of, that we deserve to die traded places with us so that we would live. That is the definition of grace. As always, may our Father Yahweh barak you, bless you in Yeshua HaMashiach's name, and shalom.